Well, good morning, everyone. Pastor Jason here. I just want to say welcome to everyone who's tuning in to our worship gathering here online at College Park Church. Maybe you've been attending College Park for years and years. You're a member or a regular attender, or maybe today is your first time joining us. You're our guest today. If that's you, we are so glad you're here, and we hope that today is a blessing for you. I want to start today by reading a few verses from the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to this passage, you can turn over to chapter 36. I'll give you a minute to do that. If you recall, after years of rebellion and disobedience against God, the Lord saw fit to judge the people of Israel by way of the Assyrians and then the Babylonians. As part of that judgment, much of the population of the country was taken captive and brought to Babylon. And this is an era we call the exile. But God was still active among his people during this time with a number of priests ministering to the people, teaching the people, and a number of prophets speaking his word to the people. Now, some of those words were messages of, of rebuke, making it clear why the Lord was judging his people. And some of those words were messages of consolation and comfort. So for the first 32 chapters of Ezekiel, we see God reviewing his judgment against Israel, but also the surrounding pagan nations. Then in chapter 33, we see a switch. Uh, the message pivots to a message of hope and vision for the restoration of Israel. And in chapter 36, starting in verse 24, he says to the nation of Israel, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. You know, I, I love this passage because not only does it speak to the great compassion that God has for his people, even when he's disciplining us, but also how the Holy Spirit has always been active and at work among God's people. And here we have this prophetic utterance that the Holy Spirit will be put in in his people. The Holy Spirit will indwell God's people, something that was brought to reality at Pentecost over 500 years later after these words were spoken by Ezekiel. It was God's plan all along, and it's something that we have the hope and the present promise of today, that we live each day with God's active presence in our very being. And did you know that today the Holy Spirit is among us as we've gathered, even as we gather separately in our homes, the Holy Spirit is dwelling among his people as we gather and prepare for worship today. And our prayer is that we will have a time of spirit-filled worship together. So let's, let's go to the Lord and ask him to bless us in that way today. Lord, we do thank you for your presence among your people. And Lord, we know that we don't even have to ask for your presence among us. You're, you are already here. We are gathered in your name. We are here to honor you, to call attention to your glory, to, to, to recognize your goodness, and to receive you into our lives today. We know you are here. And so, Lord, our prayer instead is that you would open our eyes, open our minds, open our hearts to your presence, and Lord, draw us into responsiveness today. Help us, Lord, as we worship by the power of your Holy Spirit. And it's in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning, church. We're happy that you're joining us online today as we gather to worship. Uh, if you're in your living room, uh, feel free to stand up with us and as we sing these songs together. Um, uh, this morning, I just want to quickly introduce uh, some of the band here to you in case some of you might not know who they are. Um, but over on keyboard, we have Bree. And then one of our singers here, Robin, on the far stage, and then uh, Emily. And then back here on bass guitar, we have Caleb. And then over here in the corner, uh, in the drums, we've got Monty. So, Monty, thanks for joining us these couple of weeks and, and providing drums. We love it. So, um, As we enter into worship, again, this week we are continuing our series on the Holy Spirit uh, and what it looks like to walk with the Holy Spirit. And so today I just wanted to begin by celebrating the fact that our Savior is alive 
He walks with us. He journeys along with us, and he promises to never leave us or forsake us. So let's go ahead and sing the hymn, He Lives, together this morning. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know hand of mercy I hear his voice of cheer and just the time I need him he's always near he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives salvation to impart you ask me how weary I never will despair I know that he is leading through all the stormy paths the day of his appearing will come at last he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow to impart you ask me how I know he lives he lives within my heart rejoice rejoice O Christian lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King the hope of all who see so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to A reading from Philippians 3, 4 through 14. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, 
I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Well, I just feel like that's a very powerful scripture uh, that Audrey just read for us. And uh, one of my, definitely one of my favorite scriptures um, to go back to in the Bible. Um, but as we sing this next song, You Are My Vision, I, I think that's a, an appropriate lead into uh, as, we, as we walk by the Spirit, as we live this life as, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, the, the fruit of the Spirit that comes out of us is a result of us being in communion with the Lord, um, being in relationship with Him, and really just fixing our eyes, like Paul said, on what's ahead, the, the goal, the, the prize, which is true righteousness and true communion with God that is awarded to us in Christ Jesus. And so I just love this, this song, You Are My Vision. It's the hymn, but it's kind of modified a little bit. Um, but uh, the second verse, you are my wisdom and you are my true word. I ever with you and you with me, Lord. You're my great father and I'm your true son. You dwell inside me and together we're one. And so I'm just thankful that uh, through the Holy Spirit, uh, God's presence is with us and in us. Amen. Amen. Well, let's uh, go ahead and sing this song together. You are my vision.
as we come to the time of prayer, um, just take a moment, do some breathing. Take some time and let go of any of the tensions of the day, the worries that you might be experiencing, the anxiety that you might be experiencing. As you're breathing, just breathe those out. Breathe in God's peace. Breathe in God's strength. Father, we are so thankful that you are sovereign and that you are loving. And then in the midst of this really difficult time, we can trust you. You've shown that to us over and over and over. And I pray that um, everyone listening to my voice would be able to trust you again. I pray for all those impacted by the virus. I pray that your Holy Spirit would blanket them and their families with peace. I pray that Jehovah Rapha would bring healing. And I pray that folks that may be searching during this time would fix their eyes uh, on you and maybe be drawn to a relationship with you. Father, now as we prepare for a message, I thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the teaching from our pastor. I thank you that the Spirit reminds us of everything that Jesus taught. The Spirit guides us into all truth. And also I'm thankful for the fruit of the Spirit that is in all of us as believers. And I pray that we would keep in step with the Spirit we would have our sins confessed so that the fruit would be very prominent in our lives and the way we impact others. Specifically, Father, increase the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Our, our families need that. Our loved ones need that. Our coworkers need that. And we commit all this to the precious and powerful name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning again, church. Last week in our series on the Holy Spirit, we looked at what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you recall, being filled with the Holy Spirit means we are enabled for the Christian life by the Holy Spirit on an ongoing basis in increasing measure leading to spiritual fruit. And part of our time together last week, we looked at the effects of filling the Holy Spirit. And just by way of review, we discovered that such a filling of the Holy Spirit, it impacts our worship, you know, how there's a renewal in the vibrancy of our worship, increased expressions of thanksgiving, and a recognition of Jesus' presence and authority in our lives. Being filled with the Holy Spirit also strengthens our relationships in the church, increases our capacity for joy, even in difficult circumstances, and gives us increased boldness in mission and witness. But we also talked about how the filling of the Holy Spirit enables us to live in the ways God wants us to, to overcome our sinful behaviors and our sinful attitudes, to break the chains of the things that pull us away from an abundant life in Christ. But did you know that the empowering and enabling of the Holy Spirit isn't only about not doing certain things or not thinking in certain ways? For sure, the Holy Spirit enables us to repent of sin, to stop living according to the flesh, but the Holy Spirit also enables us to do good things, to be good people, not only ceasing to do bad or sinful things, but to do good things, things that bless God and others and bring God's goodness into effect in the world. When we speak of being filled with the Holy Spirit, we talked about these effects, 
But, you know, we can also talk about the evidences. How do we know that we're being filled with the Holy Spirit? How does that show up in our lives? Some might assert that an evidence is when we do big things for God, when we do big things for God. But then, you know, we see Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 7, where he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? You know, all these big things for God. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So clearly doing big things for God isn't exactly an evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit or even of salvation for that matter. Or one might argue that years and years of service in a local church is an evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit. But it's possible to spend years and years doing things in the church, but those things are not rooted or founded on Jesus and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day, the, the final day, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. So what is the basis or the foundation of our good work and even our ministry in the church? If it's not the grace of Jesus and the enabling and leading of the Holy Spirit, it really has no eternal value. And in the end, it's just a good work in which we can brag and boast because it's an effort of our own. But authentic evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts does come in a number of different forms. For one, there's our personal internal testimony that bears witness to and gives us assurance, a peace that we belong to God. You know, in Romans 8, Paul says, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship or daughtership. <laughs> and by him, we cry, Abba, Father. And then he says, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So when the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, there's an assurance, an eternal and internal sense of being led by the spirit and a life of obedience to God's will and our belonging to him. A second evidence related to the first is an active and trusting relationship with Jesus. In John 15, Jesus says, remain in me and I, as I also remain in you. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You know, some translations say abide in me. And this includes not only our regular worship and our practice of prayer with other members of the church, but even our day-to-day -day trust in him as we actively look to him to lead us in making decisions and discerning what is good and right for, for us and our families. A third evidence is the results of one's life and ministry as they have a positive influence on the discipleship of others, the influence we have on the discipleship of others. You know, there are many in the church today whose influence is negative. They, they serve to bring people down, to discourage, to spiritually injure, or even spiritually abuse other people. Again, in Matthew 7, speaking of false prophets, Jesus says, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Thus, by their fruit will you recognize them. You know, these kinds of people provoke controversies and breed divisiveness. But let's remember that a work of the Holy Spirit is to unify the church. But these kind of people work contrary to the Holy Spirit by creating factions in the church and pitting groups against one another. On the other hand, there are those that seem to always be encouraging others in conversation, in prayer, by their generosity, and even by their own sacrifices as they relate and minister in the church. These are the, the peacemakers, right? Let's be clear. This isn't about the big things we do for God, but it's about the big influence we have on the lives of others and their walk with Jesus.
It's that overflow that we talked about last week from Romans 15 and verse 13, where Paul says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. A fourth evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit is accepting and holding to the essential teachings of the church. You know, I've known many through my course of life in ministry who at some point they come to deny um, some, some of the essential doctrines of our faith. And you know, this seriously calls into question not only their filling of the Holy Spirit, but even possibly their salvation, which let me be clear, only God himself knows that in truth and fullness. But in 1 John chapter 2, he says, no one who denies the son has the father. Whoever acknowledges the son has the father also. As for you, see that, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will also remain in the son and in the father. You know, whoever knows God and is being filled by the Holy Spirit will continue to read and delight in God's word and will believe it fully. And instead of trying to bend scripture around their preconceived ideas or preferences, instead they bend their lives around the scripture, the revealed truth and will of God. What are the essential doctrines of our faith? That might be a question on your mind. Well, <laughs> that's a whole nother sermon series. But suffice it to say today that there's definitely an order of priority with respect to our doctrines. There are those beliefs that we would consider essential or first order or top tier. The things that make the Christian faith what it is and to do without them, to do it without any one of them makes our faith something else. And to depart from them makes uh, someone something other than a follower of Christ. And then there are doctrines of a secondary and even third level that Christians can differ and even disagree on. But in short, when it comes to our major doctrines related to the nature of the Godhead, uh, the identity of Jesus, uh, humanity, sin, and salvation, those are the things that we consider to be essential. And an evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit and our belonging to the kingdom of God is to fully accept and even embrace what the scriptures clearly teach about these things. Evidence number five of the filling of the Holy Spirit, as I mentioned earlier, is a life of obedience to God's commands. A life of obedience to God's commands. Now listen, God knows our struggle with sin. Jesus himself, though never once falling or sinning, he experienced every temptation of life that we experience during his incarnate years. And the call to obey God's commands, it isn't the expectation of actual perfection, but it's a call to pursue increasing degrees of holiness. See, God familiar with our weakness and well aware of our sin, he knows that we will never reach a state of actual perfection as long as we are constrained by our flesh, by our sin nature. Some of us though, we might have a hard time with this because we feel like we're giving ourselves a license to sin. Not at all. Let's recall John's strong words in 1 John chapter 3, where he says, no one who is born of God will continue to sin. Because God's seed remains in them, they cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. But, whoa, wait, that, doesn't that sound like just the opposite? On the one hand, we think if we say God doesn't demand or expect perfection, that means we can go on and do whatever we want and let the grace of Jesus just cover it all. But on the other hand, if God does demand absolute perfection from his saved people, isn't that objectively unrealistic because of our sin nature? So how do we land on this? We have to remember that the scriptures and John in this letter emphasize the miracle of the new birth, where the Holy Spirit takes possession of our hearts and forms a new relationship to God, to his character and his ways. Instead of being committed to a self-focused me first principle of life, we come under the lordship and the leadership of Jesus. And the very purpose of our souls becomes to please God because of his love for us, to respond to his love with our lives. And our very belonging and our identity is transformed or reborn. So coming to Christ in faith isn't just about the results of this redeemed relationship has on our behavior. 
It's even more so about who we are. The very definition of human being changes for us. It's a fundamental shift in our identity. In your new identity, your new makeup, as one who has been born of God, you have God's holy seed, his Holy Spirit within you. And I love this illustration that John gives us. You know, before you came to Jesus, you were like this dirt pot. You know, you're the pot and the dirt is what's in you. It's your, your sin nature. And before Jesus, that's all that's in you is this dirt. And when you come to faith in Jesus and recognize your need for him, surrender to him and believed in his resurrection and victory, you got this seed put in you. You got the seed put in you. And when God looks at your pot now, he doesn't see the dirt. He sees the seed. And that's what it means to be saved or to be justified. God doesn't look at your sin anymore. He doesn't look at my sin anymore. He looks at me just as if I'd never sinned. And as you go on living, abiding in Jesus, that seed grows and grows in the flower pot. And it produces leaves and flowers or fruit. And it fills up more and more of the pot. There's still dirt in the pot, but you know what? There's more plant too, more flowers, more fruit. And the pot is no longer identified by the dirt alone, if at all. It's defined by the work of the seed. And then as you grow in Christ, as your plant grows, as the seed of the Holy Spirit takes over in your life, you grow and grow. And eventually, you know, you're looking like this for Jesus. You know, it's taken up a lot of the pot. There's still dirt in the pot, but look how much plants in the pot. This is what it looks like to walk with the Holy Spirit, to grow in the Holy Spirit. You know, and so the question is, does scripture call for perfection? Well, the answer is yes, but here's the thing. Jesus is the perfect one, not you. Jesus is the perfect one, not you. God calls per for perfection and Jesus steps in to be the perfect one for us. And by his spirit, Jesus is in you. So the scriptures say that our lives in general are continually and increasingly imitating Jesus growing in likeness to him in what we do and how we think and what we say. If we have a genuine saving faith and are being filled with the Holy Spirit, then there will be clear results of obedience in our lives. But again, that's by the power of the Holy Spirit and the fact that God himself lives in us and through us. So all of this is really the buildup to where we're going for the rest of today. And we could really say that this next part is evidence number six of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If we're being filled by the Holy Spirit, then we walk by the Holy Spirit. You know, the life of discipleship is often depicted in the scriptures as a journey or with the language of walking or being led. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, we walk by faith, not by sight. And in 3 John John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And Paul loves to use the language of walking in Ephesians, especially Ephesians 2.10. He says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And in Ephesians 5, especially loaded with language about walking, where he says, follow, follow God's example and walk in the way of love. He says, at one time you were darkness and now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. And he says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And in Colossians, we see Paul spelling out in more detail what it means to walk the path of discipleship. Colossians chapter one, he says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints, we have not ceased to pray for you asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father. And so here we see some other language that's familiar to many of us. The language of fruit, the language of fruit. The other place we see this language is in Galatians 5. In fact, Paul brings together both the language of walking and fruit in Galatians 5. 
So let's look at Galatians 5 together. This is our longest passage this morning, so I hope you have your Bibles ready to read along and to dig in together. Let's read this together. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the law, uh, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. So there's a lot here, a lot of great instruction for the gospel people. Most of it's pretty straightforward and and really plain to understand for those who have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. But like much of scripture, it's important to understand the context and some of the background. One question we can ask of this passage is, why is Paul at this point in the letter talking about freedom and the law? And how does that apply to the fruit of the Spirit and walking by the Spirit? So let's dig into the book of Galatians just a little bit to help us understand where Paul's coming from and how he lands here uh, in the the letter about the fruit of the Spirit, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. So let's start with the question, have you ever had a hard time accepting the fact that salvation is a free gift offered to us. I do. You know, our thinking is that such an amazing thing is forgiveness and the promise of an eternity with God must require some sort of payment from us. We thank God for his forgiveness, but sometimes we think he expects us somehow to earn his forgiveness. And we had this debt that Jesus paid for us, but there must be something we can do to pay off the debt for ourselves. Well, in the early days of the church, there was a group of people who taught just that. They were called the Judaizers. And the word Judaizer comes from a Greek verb that means to live according to Jewish customs. And what they taught was that being right with God, salvation, comes from a combination of God's grace and conforming to the law of Moses, the Old Testament law. They believe that Gentiles, non-Jews, who had be- they believe they had to become Jewish first and then they could come to Christ. And for the Judaizers, keeping the Sabbath and circumcision especially was promoted as necessary for salvation. So they believed and taught that salvation was a mixture of grace through Jesus and through works, keeping the law of Moses. And so, And we see this teaching dealt with in Acts 15 by the early church, including Paul, where they condemned it. Peter addressed it by saying this in Acts 15, God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them, the Gentiles, by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us back on Pentecost. He didn't discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke, a burden, that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just like they are. So in his letter to the Galatian church, Paul addresses it with the same force and authority because of the Judaizers influence on the town was causing unrest and division in the church. In Galatians 2, chapter uh, chapter 2, verse 16, he says, a person isn't justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too 
have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because by observing the law, no one would be justified. So to add anything to the work that Christ already did for our salvation is to negate God's grace. We are saved by grace alone through faith alone, not by returning to the law. In verse 21 of chapter two, Paul says, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. You know, there are many groups today with beliefs and practices very similar to the Judaizers of the New Testament. And the effect, whether it's intended or not, is to put followers of Christ back under the bondage of Old Testament law. There are some that hold that certain sacraments are necessary for salvation. The issues for the first century Judaizers were circumcision and Sabbath keeping. The issues for some today are baptism, confession, communion, penance, and other things. And many of of those things are even good for us to do. But the attempt to earn or pay off our salvation by performing certain acts or works is entirely contrary to the gospel, which is that we are saved by grace alone through our faith, through our belief in Jesus. The Judaizers, they upheld the Mosaic law as necessary for salvation and others today uphold other man-made traditions as necessary. And the problem with that view is that it makes Jesus' death as being insufficient. The scriptures are clear that the very meaning of grace is undeserved blessing. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve, which is eternal separation from God. Grace, though, goes even further, that we do get what we don't deserve and can't go get for ourselves, which is eternal communion, connection, and relationship with God. And the attempt to add human works to God's grace, it violates the very meaning and power of grace. Paul says in Romans 11, but if it, salvation, if salvation is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. And then we get to the beginning of Galatians chapter five. And Paul says this in the first four verses. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. And you, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ because you have fallen away from grace. So here we are, Paul has addressed this controversy. We're not saved by any thing or any work that we do for God, not by any ritual work, whether it's baptism or communion or confession or repentance, not by any moral work, such as giving to a charity or marching for justice or going on a mission trip. And we're also not saved by abstaining from immoral behavior. Only by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone are we saved. The beginning of our new life in Christ, our new birth, our regeneration, or our being made new. I love that there's so many ways to refer to it. This is a work of the Holy Spirit, which involves none of our effort. It's entirely the mercy of God, the grace of Jesus, and the power and effect of the Holy Spirit on us and in us that brings about our new birth. That's why Jesus, in John chapter 6, he says, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. And then two verses later, in verse 65, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. So new birth, regeneration, is entirely the work of God, the Holy Spirit, on our lives. And so this is a profound truth, a truth that we need to remind ourselves of all the time because we tend to drift back into thinking about God in some sort of transactional way. And when we think about him in that way, we act in that way. And when we act in that way, attempting to trade our good works or abstaining from bad works in order to earn our standing before God, then instead of experiencing the abundance of life that God has in store for us, we're instead bonded to or enslaved by our guilt, our shame, our fear of judgment, and our lack of joy, because we just can't do it. We're incapable. But here in Galatians 5, as well as many other places in scripture, 
we also see the calling to, holy, to living holy lives, don't we? Jesus himself gave a whole sermon while standing on a mount that largely focuses on how to live as his kingdom people, his gospel people. Paul talks about how to live holy lives in every letter he wrote. There's lots of moral instruction there. But we have to pay attention to what is the foundation, the impetus or the originator of holiness. What produces holiness? And what Paul argues over and over again is that it's not our effort that produces holiness, but it's the Holy Spirit. It's not our rules that produce holiness. It's the Holy Spirit. It's not our ceremonies and our traditions that produce holiness. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of Christ in you specifically being filled with and walking with the Holy Spirit. Last week, I mentioned Romans 8 and Galatians 3, verses 2 and 3. These are important, and I'm going to put these verses up again. Romans 8, 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, then you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. And Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3 says, did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish then after beginning by means of the Spirit that you're now trying to finish by means of the flesh? And so then we get to Galatians chapter 5 and Paul's communicating the same idea there that he is in those last two verses we read. In Galatians 5 chapter 1, he says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And then in verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So, we can try to sum it up simply like this. Paul says, you weren't saved by the law, so don't try to live by the law. You were saved by grace, so now go and live by grace. The Holy Spirit caused your new birth, so now go and live by the Holy Spirit. In other words, walk by the Holy Spirit. And once we understand and surrender to this dynamic, the rest of Galatians 5 really falls into place for us. And we have to surrender to it, not just understand it. In my flesh, in my selfishness, I want to earn it. In my pride, I want to be able to say that I deserve it. In my desire for accomplishment, I want to say that I did it, that at least I brought something to the table. But the message of scripture over and over again is that I cannot I just cannot. Romans chapter three, Paul says, there is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands and there's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And so the power to do good, the enabling of righteousness in our lives the journey of purity and holiness is a power and enabling and a purification that we can't do to ourselves. But before you let that depress you, before you begin feeling loathsome and hopeless, remember that Paul calls it freedom. Paul says it's freedom because you don't have to be burdened by your inability to do this to yourself. Instead, you have the indwelling, leading, guiding, convicting, encouraging, empowering, enabling, purifying, and filling presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And the rest of Galatians 5 is really just Paul showing us the effects of walking by the Holy Spirit. He shows us how that's different from walking by the flesh, by the sinful nature, which is subject to the judgment of the law. In verses 16 and 17, he says, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you're not to do whatever you want. Every person has two natures. One we call the flesh or the sinful nature. And the other is the Spirit, which is dead, even from our conception, from our, in, from our birth. And when we come to faith in Jesus, our spirit is reborn or born again. And these two natures will always be in deep and relentless conflict with each other. And the sinful nature, it does no good and doesn't even desire good. And the spirit does no evil and opposes anything that does not please God. And 
as we learn by grace to walk by the Holy Spirit, the sinful nature is increasingly subdued, but it will never be eliminated in this life. When we come to Jesus, we are released from the penalty of sin. But through the rest of our lives in these bodies, we submit to the Holy Spirit to overcome the power of sin. But it's a lifelong journey, a lifelong battle. And then only on the day that we go home to heaven will, be, will we be finally free from even the presence of sin. But until that day, we're never released from relying on God's grace and the power and the enabling of the Holy Spirit. In verse 18, Paul says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So Paul reminds us that even though he's talking about our call to live a, go a godly life, he's not reverting to legalism. Walking by the Spirit is neither legalism or license. It's, and it's also not some middle ground between the two. Instead, it's a life of faith and love that allows a person to be led by the Spirit instead of the flesh. We're not under the condemnation of the law because we are, in fact, obeying the law of Christ, not by the letter and legal demands, but by the spirit in which the law was intended in the first place to lead us into holy lives, lived in fellowship with God, honoring and glorifying him. Instead of feeling the burden of the law's demands, we have a joy, a freedom in obeying the Lord because we have been reformed, reborn in his goodness and in his delight. And next we see the difference between the two. Paul shows how the flesh and the spirit are in conflict by contrasting the works of each. He provides a sample checklist for measuring those who consider themselves spiritual. If one's life is characterized by the traits in the first list, then he or she is either not a believer or else a believer who is not being led by God's spirit. If one's life is characterized by the qualities in the second list, then this is a great evidence of a person's salvation and walking by the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, he says the acts of the flesh are obvious. And then you can read that list again there. And then he, he finishes that part by saying, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul issues a pretty stern warning here. But let's understand it correctly. Paul isn't saying that if a Christian falls into an isolated lapse into sin, that he or she loses their salvation. Instead, Paul is talking about a chronic and habitual pattern of sin to which someone gives themselves over. The point of his warning here is that those who continually practice such sins, they do not have or they do not live by the Holy Spirit. And the judgment of not inheriting God's kingdom it really isn't about their behavior. It's about the fact that they're not in Christ at all. They're not saved. And then Paul talks about what happens in us when the desires produced by the Holy Spirit are greater than the desires produced by the flesh. So here we are finally to the, Holy, to the fruit of the Holy Spirit, where he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he adds, against such things, there is no law. This is what happens in our lives by the filling of the Holy Spirit, by the enabling of the Holy Spirit, when we walk by the Holy Spirit. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's his fruit, not our work. The emphasis is on the initiative of the Holy Spirit. So when we read this list of qualities, this list of character traits called the fruit of the Spirit, it's the wrong question to ask, which fruit do I need to work on? Because you, you can't really specifically work on each of these qualities individually, because as we discovered, you don't have the ability to. What you work on instead is surrendering to the Holy Spirit so that he can yield his fruit in your life, not by the power of your effort and self-correction, but by his power living in you and working with you. His part is the power. Our part is surrender. That's what it means to walk by the Holy Spirit, to surrender every day, even every moment when it comes to our besetting or recurring sin. Surrender. Die to yourself. And you know, the question of how is very similar to last week. In that message, we asked, how do I become filled with the Holy Spirit? And I shared this with you. Surrender, rely, obey, and pray. Surrender your life fully to God. Rely on his power to live the life that he's called us to. 
obey, cooperating with the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, and pray continually for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, you could take that same framework of application home with you today. Maybe it can be a structure that guides your prayers each day. Go back to that message last week and pick up the scriptures connected with each of those aspects of fostering your faith and pray them before the Lord. Or let me give you another framework for Bible reading and prayer that maybe you can carry into this week. Another, w- another way that we can pray and ask God to help us surrender and walk by the Holy Spirit is first to acknowledge to confess that you can do nothing good without the enabling of the Holy Spirit. Read through John chapter 15, where Jesus says, I'm the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, I heard someone once say that apart from Jesus, you can do a whole lot of things, but those things are nothing. Secondly, Pray for godly desires. Make Psalm 51, verse 10, your prayer, where David says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Or go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, and turn that into a prayer for yourself. Lord, make your love increase in me and overflow for others. Strengthen my heart so I will be blameless and holy in your presence. Third, pray that God will help you trust that sin has no power over you. Let the scriptures remind you of this truth, like in Romans chapter 6, where Paul says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Fourth, Pray for the resolve to act in accordance with the leading and the enabling of the Holy Spirit. Pray for the resolve to act, which you can only do after confessing, praying, and trusting. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says, It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It's God who works in you. Or back to Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, where Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I now live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So since this is true, ask God for the strength, his strength to respond in love and faith and obedience. And fifth, finally, in your prayers, thank God for his fruit in you and through you. If we can do no good thing apart from the enabling of the Holy Spirit, then not only must we ask for his enabling, but we we have to thank him for giving us the ability when he does. And did you know that when we express our thanks to God in this way, it, it helps us return back to the first step, acknowledging and confessing that we can do no good thing without him. Well, I hope this aids your prayers for this week. I hope it's a help this week and even all of life as we come to him in surrender, seeking to walk by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. God, there might be many of us today who are burdened um, by our sense of guilt or shame over our sin, the things that we continually struggle with. There's some of us today feeling like we'll never be free from some of this. And we're even on the edge of hopelessness. God, I pray that by the power of your spirit, you would pull, pull my brothers and sisters back away from that edge of hopelessness, just enough for your Holy Spirit to get in there and to remind my brothers and sisters of who they are in you. The fact that you love them, you've called them, you've redeemed them. And as your word says, you know them by name and they are yours. So God, we pray for the filling of your Holy Spirit in our lives today so that we can overcome fear, we can overcome temptation, we can overcome worry, we can overcome pride. We we can overcome anything that stands between us and you and that stands between us and each other as your people. May you be glorified in your church by the filling of the church with your Holy Spirit as we seek to walk by your Holy Spirit. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.
Well, as we close the service this morning, we're going to sing a song called Build My Life. And in the bridge of this song, it says, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. And uh, as we think about the fruit of the Spirit and, and all, all the, the fruit that the, the Spirit of God brings out of us, uh, how it reminded me of uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, as he wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, about how the greatest of all of these gifts, the greatest of all these things is love. Uh, we can speak with angelic tongues, or we can give all that we have away to the poor, or we can have faith, uh, faith strong enough to move mountains. But if we have all these things, but we don't have love, then it's all meaningless, and how, how love is the most important, a love of God and love of others. And so uh, um, as we, we walk with the Spirit, and as we consider uh, the fruit that should be coming out of our lives, um, the first and the greatest uh, evidence in the fruit of the Spirit should be love. Amen? Amen. So let's go ahead and sing this together as we uh, worship the Lord.
Amen. Well, that is our prayer, Lord, and uh, that you would fill us and, and show us how to love those around us well, just as you have loved us. Amen. Well, church, let me go ahead and leave you with this benediction, if you would uh, bow your heads with me. May the Spirit of Christ dwell with you richly, and may you see much spirit or much fruit of the Spirit of God in your life as you walk with the Spirit day by day. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, have a blessed week.